to come. Eh, lo presento un momento. Entonces, la, um, eh, ellos, él viene, es... Eh, can you state your name? Arian Kampaus, it's Dutch, I'm sorry. Eh, 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 él viene en nombre de CAG, Center for Investigative Journalism. Eh, es, eh, es una organización. Eh, you will present more specific yourself. Eh? Eh, es una organización muy importante. Tenían también que estar con el Gavin, que es como el señor de la organización. Es un periodista que ha trabajado, eh, pues, desde con temas de Snowden. WikiLeaks es el primero que ha, eh, ha empezado a trabajar WikiLeaks con WikiLeaks antes que WikiLeaks fuera tan famoso, en fin, es una organización que para nosotros combina exactamente esta alianza entre periodismo y ciudadanos. Entonces, ellos, eh, concretamente él y una compañera suya, que ahora no... Eh, ¿Puedes proyectar el, 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 el comment? Uh, what's the, uh, the co-author name, please? Sorry. The co-author of the book. Silky Carlo, she's a London-based journalist. She actually does most of the writing, so all the understandable writing is hers. <laughs> and any technical mistake you find in the book is mine. I apologize for that. Okay. Entonces, han, hecho, han escrito un manual que se llama Seguridad de la Información para Periodistas. Y cuando los hemos encontrado este verano al, al campamento del Chaos Computer Camp, eh, un, un encuentro hacker que, que hay eh, cada año y cada cuatro años en el campo, eh, estaban preparando la versión castellana del, de, de este manual. Entonces, era lo que os queríamos presentar hoy, la versión castellana del manual, solo que la traducción eh, la ha hecho una persona muy voluntarosa seguramente, pero que no sabía castellano. Pero como ellos son ingleses, pensa, nos han entregado un documento que no era castellano, con, muy contentos, diciendo, eh, ya está, ya podemos publicar. Bueno, total, que hemos intentado arreglarla un poquito, eh, ha habido un equipo de voluntarios también arreglándola, pero como partía de, un, de una traducción demencial, pues en fin. Total, que la tenéis ahí colgada, más o menos entiende lo que quiere decir y está colgada en este comment que mandaremos para que entre todos la dejemos niquelada colaborativamente porque no hay manera de arreglarla. Entonces, él viene a presentar este documento y luego dará un taller específico, o sea, aquí explicará un poco la parte teórica y luego dará un, eh, un taller específico sobre este tema para periodistas eh, luego en la sesión de talleres. Yo quiero, está Marta Peirano aquí. Vale. Eh, yo quiero decir que hay eh, ya eh, hecho por una periodista que le habíamos pedido de participar, pero como viene a cubrir el evento, ha dicho muy éticamente que no podía estar dentro y fuera del evento, yo creo que eh, es muy, muy importante que todo el mundo, eh, no, no recibo ni un céntimo para lo que voy a decir, compre este libro que es el pequeño libro rojo del activismo en red, y lea al menos la, la introducción y la primera parte. La introducción es de Snowden y la primera parte, eh, en ella Marta nos explica... Eh, justamente como por lo que, lo que estaba diciendo antes que el, el periodista Greenwald que es el que se ha hecho muy famoso por muchas cosas pero por ejemplo por las revelaciones de Snowden pues ha dejado Snowden en la estacada casi un año porque no eh, se negaba o no sabía que tenía que encriptar su comunicación entonces Snowden no le podía mandar la información que luego finalmente le hizo famoso entonces es tan importante eh, eh, nos explica un poco en, en, en plata porque sobre todo en una colaboración entre activismo y periodista, pero para todos los ciudadanos es muy importante que tengamos rudimentos al menos de, de encriptación. Entonces, este manual, este libro y este manual que él ahora va a presentar, para nosotros os invitamos eh, pues a ayudarnos a traducirlo y a leerlo y a leer este libro para que eh, podamos defendernos y organizarnos. Entonces, all yours. Um, I done anything yet. There we go. Thank you. Um, can we get that full screen? Yay. There we go. Um, so yes, I've been training journalists about since 2009. Uh, I've been working in IT since the mid 90s, first in a purely technical role and then more and more of the policy side. I worked in the Netherlands on uh, the first uh, Western country national free software policy that was in effect from 2007 to about 2010 when the Dutch Minister for Trade got a phone call that basically told him to stop that shit and keep buying our software. Um, so that's how that works. And maybe Spain um, has more courage. Um, what I noticed after Snowden is that the demand for, f especially from journalists, but also from 
other just human being citizens uh, for, for training in basic information security for individuals exploded. And so Silky's time in my time just became the limiting factor. So we decided to, that we needed to write it all down and make the book freely available to anybody who wants it. So the entire book is free online in English. Um, and if you want to take part of it or rewrite it for 12 year olds or make a theater play out of it, then please do. You know, we don't want to charge money for it. Um, we just want to spread the information. Um, so the last 15 years, the world's gone a bit funny, and a lot of the language that we considered normal is now crazy. Um, so one word about language before I move on to the InfoSec stuff, and uh, also a word to our hardworking friends in uh, particularly Brussels, but many other things. Please stop adopting the language of our opponents. Don't call a trade negotiation a trade negotiation when actually it's a corporate coup d'etat. We have a word for the merger of state and corporate power in Europe. It's called fascism. And if we call it fascism, then we will know what to do. Don't legitimize it by keep calling it a trade negotiation. Don't legitimize what amounts to medical genocide by calling it intellectual property. It's, please, let's stop doing that. All right. Um, <laughs> So to our friends from the media, um, many of you maybe have been slacking off a tad too much. Maybe not the journalists who are here, but certainly some of your colleagues. This is an extreme example. This is an actual screenshot from an actual Fox News news broadcast from 2011, when, as you may remember, there was a bit of a thing going on in Egypt. And many people in America were afraid that maybe the Muslim Brotherhood would have a victory in Europe and uh, in Egypt, and they would not be so compliant with US strategic interests. And so Fox News explained that a Muslim Brotherhood victory in Egypt would be a strategic disaster for the United States, because, of course, the important position of Egypt smack in the middle there between Iran and Syria. Um, now, so whenever you come up to these kinds of things, there's always two competing theories of what actually happened here. The one theory is that the entire news desk of Fox News can't find Egypt on Google Maps. That's one way of explaining this. And, and without offending any individual here, we all do know that the stupidity of some of our friends in the former colonies almost has no bounds. So that's certainly a possibility, but it's sort of a bit hard. The other possibility, of course, is this is actually just propaganda. And again, I think we should just call it what it is. It's propaganda. It's lies. So when European national broadcaster opened the 8 o'clock evening news by saying that the United Nations is worried about the Iranian nuclear weapons program, then A, they've suggested that there is a uni uni you know, unified opinion within the UN, and B, they're suggesting that there is actually proof for an Iranian weapons program. So there's like two lies in the opening sentence of the 8 o'clock news that is paid for by your taxes. We shouldn't accept this sort of bullshit. We really shouldn't. Um, hello? No, is technology failing us? <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so yes, uh, if you have one of those uh, TV Be Gone devices that switches off all televisions, um, I think the TV remote off button is by far the most powerful anti-terrorism tool we have. Um, <laughs> At least, at least until such time that uh, the uh, TV media you know, joins us again on the human side of things. So uh, we've learned over the last two years much more than in the years before, although in technical uh, circles that I travel in, most of the stuff that's known as revealed, um, at least the, sort of the, the, the big strategic parts of it were already known. We now know much more of the technical details. Uh, so I live in Berlin. And this was the viral picture that um, went around Germany in the summer of 2013. For those that don't speak German, um, the, the girl asks Obama, this, so this is a picture that was actually taken in Berlin when Obama visited it two weeks after Snowden broke. And so the girl asks Obama, my daddy says you can look into my computer. And Obama answers, that's not your daddy. Because of course, <laughs> Obama gets the daily NSA briefing, so he would know that. Um, and it is actually the mission of the NSA to collect that type of information, just on the off chance that 10 years from now, her daddy becomes the new finance minister for Germany, and an American delegation needs to meet him in Geneva on something that they, again, call a trade negotiation. I would call it something else. Um, so that's what the NSA does. So again, let's not legitimize mass surveillance by suggesting that it has anything to do with counterterrorism. It doesn't have to do anything with counterterrorism. It never had anything to do with counterterrorism. And even the formal NSA people, three of them are out there, will tell you that the NSA doesn't do counterterrorism. It's not their job. They were designed to take down the Soviet Union, and they did that just fine. And after that, they went looking for a new job. 
and they found it in industrial espionage and political subversion and repressing democratic tendencies in their so-called partner countries, and that's what they do. So yeah, all of us are in here, all of us, unless you've been living under a rock. Um, so one of the ways you can know that um, this is not about counterterrorism is that the NSA tracks um, the porn habits of people who work for Amnesty International or Doctors Without Borders or the staffers who work for Angela Merkel. Now, you know, you can think what you think about Amnesty International, but they're not terrorists. I mean, you know, sometimes they may be not as effective as they should be, but they're not terrorists, really, they're not. And so tracking their porn habits as an option to maybe manipulating them or pressuring them into other kinds of behaviors has nothing to do with finding the terrorists. Although, of course, most of the terrorists, you know, the CIA knows exactly who they are because they usually are the ones training them and arming them, right? Historically speaking, that's, um, that's been the case. Uh, I think I'm going to wave because the wireless thing, it worked earlier two hours ago when we were trying this, but maybe we're being NSA jammed right now. That's entirely possible. Um, so uh, WikiLeaks um, uh, did a lot of uh, publishing recently on documents where it turns out that um, corporate espionage or industrial espionage from the NSA and other agencies against European interests doesn't just happen against large corporations like Siemens or Airbus or Shell or stuff like that. It happens to fairly small like French agricultural cooperatives and stuff like that. So everybody is the target. Again, it has nothing to do with terrorism. It all has to do with just basically robbing Europe. The German government has just officially stated for the first time, quite revolutionary, and as the first European government, that they now officially estimate that Germany is, is losing 50 billion euros per year to America because of industrial espionage, which is mostly enabled by NSA espionage of their infrastructure. 50 billion a year, that's a lot of jobs. That's most of their economic growth that goes out the window. I am sure that a comparable amount for Spain, if we correct for the size of the country. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to go through some of these examples. Yes, if you're a journalist and you're doing anything uh, that's worthwhile, then you two are being spied on. Next slide, please. Um, uh, if you're not being spied as a journalist, basically, you need to step it up a bit. That, that would be my tip. <laughs> Uh, I mean, really, you know, the entire world is on fire. If you're a journalist and nobody is interested enough in your work to spy on you, then clearly you're not not doing your job, or I don't know, you're just I don't know what you're doing. You're you're in the PR business. Just okay. We're gonna try this. Yay! So yeah, it goes on and on and on. So. Um, a lot of people now use these so-called cloud services. Cloud services is a PR team from the, um, uh, from the IT industry to try to sell you stuff and to try to surrender your privacy. And do there is no cloud. There's just other people's computers. If you use Dropbox or Gmail or Facebook or, or any of that sort of stuff to do anything that's more important than sharing the picture of your cat, although even that could be a privacy violation if there's somebody else in the picture or if you know, there's a location tag. Um, you put it in the cloud, yeah, it's, you're putting it on somebody else's computer. And you probably don't know where that computer physically is, what legal regime it falls under, and who actually controls that computer. So let's all stop doing that. And if we use this kind of technology, the technology itself is not a bad idea. You know, running large groups of free software Linux computers to store data and share it, that's a great idea. But it needs to be close to us. Ideally within your own country, but certainly at least within Europe. And it needs to be under control of a European corporation so it's not under the Patriot Act, which is what you get when you use American companies. If you use anything made by an American company, it falls under the Patriot Act. And that means as a non-US citizen, you have no rights. You have less rights than before the Magna Carta was invented. So basically, in Europe, we've struggled for over 800 years to develop the concept of human rights, and you're just throwing it away because Dropbox is inconvenient. So A, you're destroying your own privacy, and you're dishonoring 800 years of activist struggle for human rights. So please stop doing that. So yes, if you have an iPhone or one of those other brands, it doesn't really matter. They're all completely fucked out of the box. You can't do anything about it. That doesn't mean you should throw them away. You know, A smartphone can be a convenient device. I love using my smartphone to find my ways around cities that I know, don't know my way around. I love GPS. But don't use it professionally as an activist or a journalist when you're doing something important. Leave it at home. Plug it into the power so it remains on. Find the most annoying playlist you can find on the interwebs. Dial it up and walk out the door. And if anybody's listening to your phone, they will be listening to a 20-hour loop of Neon Cut. And won't that be wonderful? 
or maybe you can play speeches from Julian Assange and Edward Snowden, and then the person who's listening can listen to that for 20 hours. Wouldn't that be good? Yeah. Might be educa I consider it an educational opportunity. Right? Um, so it turns out the CIA also listens to all the I devices because they don't trust the NSA, which are their opponents for, uh, for budget, obviously. So they have their own completely separate program to fuck with all those things. So think of it as an entertainment device and a media player, and that's all fine. Just don't think of it as a secure communications device. So if you're going to talk to a source, leave your phone at home and tell them to do the same. And then maybe you can have a private conversation. Um, I'm going to uh, talk more about uh, some of the some of the technical stuff. So yeah, it's the same with Android phones. I don't want to just hate on Apple. They're all completely screwed. Um, and it's not just mobile phone. It's all of it. It's all of it. And um, as Germany already mentioned, it is an industrial technological challenge of the greatest order because we need to replace all of this in Europe if we want to be a bunch of sovereign countries with human rights. It's either that or we are a digital colony of the United States. It's that simple a choice. Now, Jeremy said that this was a big challenge, and it is. However, it is also a 250 billion euro a year opportunity, because that's the amount of money that Europe every year sends to America to pay for all that crap that spies on us. So we are a 500 million people political union. Why don't we build all this stuff ourselves instead of paying a godsmacking amount of money for technology abroad that then destroys our economy by doing industrial espionage, which is probably another 250 billion. That's several million jobs. That's more computer programmers and IT people than all the big American companies put together. We can just hire them without spending more money than we're already spending. In fact, Spain could do it on their own. They could just stop buying the 12 billion euro a year that you pay for foreign software Hire six or seven hundred thousand programmers. I hear there's some unemployment issues in this country. So use that money that way, keep it in the family, and then build stuff you need yourself. And work with Germany, another country that understands fascism and it's important to fight it. They, they really get that in Germany. Seriously, they do, which is why I live in Berlin. Um, work with them and, and yeah, develop the hardware. Maybe other countries will want to, want to help. Maybe France, maybe... Uh, Switzerland, those countries where people still some, uh, understand something about democracy, those are the countries you need to work with. There is this other country just sort of off the coast of Europe, you just, yeah, no, that's not going to happen there. They, they're just sort of, they've been painted grey since World War II. They, they just have forgotten to put USS UK on it, but basically it's a, a US aircraft carrier that hasn't been painted grey. So they're not going to be the one. Now, um, if you're a real journalist or activist and you're doing actually serious stuff, you're starting to hurt really some people, which means you're really doing your job, then yes, somebody is going to come after you, and it's called Tailored Access Operations. Um, and they have all kinds of uh, nasty chips and technologies to go after laptops that are highly secured, uh, but still get into them. This is one of them. Um, this is the cotton mouth chip over there. It's a big, it's a tiny, tiny chip. You can't really find it inside the USB plug uh, if you don't have an X-ray machine and know what to look for. And even then, it's pretty hard. Now, how does that chip that is not in every USB plug get into the plug that goes into your computer? Well, it's put there by a CIA special operations team at three in the morning at the postal office because you were foolish enough to order your new printer or scanner online through Amazon with your credit card and have it shipped to your work and home address. Don't do that. If you need secure hardware, do not order it online. Don't call the shop where you're going to buy it before you're going to buy it. Don't visit their website. Walk out the door without your phone, with a wad of cash in your hand, go to a shop, ask for a box, hand over money, and walk out the door. And then you have some chance that it's not completely pre-bugged by the time you get it. Otherwise, I'm sorry, if you're a serious journalist or activist, this is just not going to happen. This happens at scale. This is an actual picture from the Snowden document, so this is not made up. This is the CIA manual on how to do this. Um, and it happens to individual journalists. It also happens to the entire European Parliament, which turns out that their Israeli telecoms provider had provided lots of additional features that were, shall we say, not entirely documented, which means that pretty much every room in the European Parliament was being listened on to by the Mossad in real time. So yeah, it sounds all crazy, but it's really true. Um, so I've experienced over well over a decade that if you try to explain this stuff to people, they called you a crazy person. Uh, so thanks for Mr. Snowden, because he made my work a lot easier. Because now we have the documentary proof, and we don't longer have to discuss whether it's happening. Now we're only going to be talking about what we're going to do about it, because that's the only sensible discussion. So our parliament has known about this stuff since 2001. 
when they got the first report on this. And the report actually mentions all the good countermeasures that we now know work because of the Snowden documents, because good email encryption and the, the Tor browser and all those kinds of technologies are called by the NSA a major headache, which is really the best security endorsement you can find on the planet right now. Um, so as I said, I worked in the Netherlands on free software policy uh, uh, for the public sector, which is about 40% of the Dutch economy. Open, s uh, open standards and free software was going to be mandatory for government use. And we actually got that through Parliament after about five years of lobbying in 2007. And then it started to work, and then it was forced down by uh, some phone calls from the White House. Um, that was actually the Obama presidency that shut that particular one down. Um, so right now, governments, regrettably, are not our friends. Maybe we need to explain it a bit more to them, uh, but in the meantime, we need to just also ignore governments and do our own thing. So we're in pretty deep doo-doo, um, and we're going to have to fight. I do also do president, uh, presentations in the UK, so this is mandatory. Um, so small acts of resistance are very important, because we need another Snowden, and basically we need an update. So if you suspect you might be listened to, then talk to the room. Because if nobody's listening, there's no harm done. And if somebody's listening, maybe at some point you'll convince them. There are 450,000 people working for the NSA and another 70 to 80,000 contractors. Many of them are smart 20-somethings. And we only need one or two, you know, convince them to come to the light side. Because they're all geeks. They've all watched Star Wars. So you just need to remind them that in the end, the rebels always win. And, you know, all the cool girls are there. And just come and join us, you know. Now, if you use social media, and many of us, of course, do, including myself on occasion, then social media is a very good platform to spread disinformation about yourself as well as information about yourself. So you can give other people limited access to, for instance, your Twitter account. And while you are off without your phone on a t train ticket that you paid for with cash to meet your source, somebody else can send out a tweet in your name about a lunch that didn't happen in a city you were not, thereby poisoning this giant well of information and making it a giant piss pool of disinformation that some poor NSA bastard still has to sift through. Because let's make him work for their money, it's easy and it's fun. Um, so it's a numbers game. The NSA is very big and very powerful. They have a 100 billion uh, dollar a year budget, which makes them larger than most nation states on this planet. Um, but they're not made of magic. So their budget is only 100 billion a year. And right now they can monitor pretty much all of us all the time. Um, because most of us don't fight back. Most of us type all our dreams into the Google search bar and you know, talk to phones that are in the room that have microphones that can be listened to in real time and cameras that can watch and all that stuff. We need to just fight back a little bit. And does that mean that each of us individually can no longer be monitored by the NSA if they direct all their attention at us? No, probably not. Most of us can't win from the NSA in a one-to-one -one fight. But if all of us make it just a million times more expensive to survey us, then most of us will have our privacy back. And then they will you know, have to you know, focus their energy on, on maybe Jeremy and me and a few other poor salts who may be a little bit higher on their shit list than, than some other people on this planet. Um, so some of the tricks I'll be teaching later today and that are in the book, so you can also teach yourself, um, will increase the cost something like it's from 10 cents per day, which it is now to something like $100,000 per day. This is something that most of us can do. If you can work a word processor, and if you want to spend one weekend teaching yourself some tricks, then that's what you can achieve. And then maybe you can teach others. And you know, as if most Europeans can do this, then we will have some sort of privacy again in Europe. And then we can spend the 10 years on replacing all the stuff. So explain this to people. Have a good password. Don't reuse passwords, please. Now, there are religious debates among security experts on the interwebs as to what constitutes a good password. I tend to stay away from religious debates. There are several solutions to the same problem. This is a very useful infographic to just explain it to people. You can do short and complex or long and less complex. I prefer longer, less complex passwords because they're just sentences that I make up in my head that from my warped mind, nobody will ever be able to guess because it's a memory and a song text mixed up in some weird shape. And then I can have a 24 character password that I can type in very quickly. And it won't even look like I'm typing in a password because I'm not doing like the three fingered null pinch on my keyboard, right? It works very well, but it's a personal preference. Um, I'm gonna skip over the email encryption, uh, but this is what an encrypted email looks like. And then you can just say, fuck the NSA as much as you want. Although if you say it in the subject, they will read it. So you may or may not wanna do that. That's a personal thing. Um, 
you can put in the subject very innocuous non-information like the dates or you know if you're more adventurous you could say about those plutonium triggers dot dot dots but don't do that if you plan to travel to the US because yes you will get in serious trouble they have no sense of humor uh, there anymore when it comes to this <laughs> so we can protect the content and the integrity of your email communications I think it's a very useful tool because we all use email at some level and if you don't then you should um, and the Tor uh, browser and Tor other technologies can protect your location, so you can hide where you are and who you are when you're visiting websites and doing online research as, a, as an investigator or an activist or a journalist. And OTR, off-the-record chat, allows for real-time chat with total anonymity, because both the location and the contents uh, can be uh, protected. And if you set it up correctly, there will be no record of what you're doing anywhere, not even on your computer. And so even if it gets seized or impounded, there is no track record of it. So all these tools m pro properly really work, and we know from the Snowden documents that the NSA cannot crack this. If you use this correctly on a 150 euro second-hand laptop, you're NSA proof. And so there they're sitting with their 100 billion dollar budget, and they can't read your text. And that's pretty cool, I think. So this is Tails. I have a bunch of these uh, sticks uh, with me for people who want to make a copy or want to buy one of me at the cost of the hardware. You can put it on a five euro uh, USB drive and it's a complete secure operating system that you can then run on other computers that may not be entirely secure of themselves. It looks like Windows 8, so you're looking like a completely innocent tourist, but under the hood it is sort of mil-spec um, Linux that is completely hardened against surveillance. So this is what Glenn Greenwald uses, this is what the WikiLeaks core team uses, and WikiLeaks is still successful right now they're publishing um, uh, the, the emails from the current CIA director and nobody saw that coming and I deduced from their continued success as a publishing organization that they despite being under massive massive surveillance directed at them they can still communicate securely by using some of these very basic tools with proper discipline so it really works so you know you can have these even as jewelry for like a euro more you have 24 garreted gold plated usb drives wear them around your neck wear them always you can shower with it i know i've tried and that's where all your important information is and even then if your laptop gets stolen or impounded you still have your important stuff somewhere else that's stuff you can do um these i advise for journalists who go to like countries whose name ends in stan and stuff like that because then you can actually hide it on your body or in an emergency even inside your body because if you spend just a month interviewing the political opposition of Kazakhstan you do not want those interviews falling in the hand of the Kazakh government because it's not just you who will end up dead but maybe 30 or 40 other people um, so these technologies they really can save human lives and they do on a daily basis just for most of us in Europe it seems a bit far away um, so this is one of those secure computers and we open it up and we take out all the naughty bits. Now this may look a bit scary. Silky, my co-author, when I started working with her on this, she could barely operate her MacBook laptops. Now she can do open heart surgery on a ThinkPad on the bar of a hotel desk in 45 minutes, merely using a Swiss Army knife. And it's pretty cool actually to see her do that because of all the other gentlemen then watching in amazement. This is stuff you can learn. I've trained several hundred journalists to do this. The youngest was 14, the oldest was 84. And the only thing I always see with the groups we train, if you want to learn this, if you have motivation, you can do this. This is not about being a computer scientist or an electronics engineer or even particularly technical. It's just a bunch of tricks and you can learn it. And if you're in a position as an activist or a journalist or if you're politically active or just want to be a citizen with privacy, then these are some of the things you need to learn. And it's a lot less harder than all the other stuff. And if you watched more than 100 hour TV this year, then that's time you could have learned to use this stuff. So it's really not hard. Now, if you're a media organization or an activist organization, then there's three levels of security that you need to build and you need to do it quickly. So out on the internet, in the wildlands, you have no control, privacy, or any say about your data. It's, it's literally a jungle out there, and the NSA is the biggest dog on the corner, and you have no control. Inside, maybe you've done a few things, and that will help, and that's great. But you see, there's gates there, there's a mail server, there's a web server. So you're never going to get this entire thing securely. A newsroom, you're never going to defend an entire newsroom. Not for the next five years in Europe. We don't have the technology today. But you can create a little castle in the middle that you can't keep secure. And I've helped a few European newspapers to develop just such secure rooms. And the budgets for that are actually quite modest which means that now Le Monde can actually write on the French nuclear industry or the French intelligence services, and they have their secure room inside their building, which Le Monde has actually written about this, so I can say this, um, which even the French secret service cannot get into, neither physically nor cryptographically. 
And again, this is just a bunch of laptops, none of which are more than 200 euros a pop, and a bunch of USB drives, none of which are more than 10 euros a pop, and software that will never cost anything. So the real investment is people putting in the time to do it. And with the book, we hope to make that a little bit easier, uh, but we're going to need a lot of feedback on it because I'm sure that things will get bigger. Now, I agree with Jeremy. This is a 10-year program at least, which is why we should be starting tonight and not wait a day longer because we've already waited 12 years too long since we got the report in, in, in 2001. Um, but actually, it's pretty cool to do. So I'm a security professional, and I get paid by very large corporations, fairly obscene amounts of money to just worry and give them a very toned down version of this presentation. Um, but actually, mostly, of course, it's, it's deadly boring. Um, so for most of my activism, pretty much all of my activism, I don't get paid. Maybe somebody pays a plane ticket, but it is so much more fun to do and so much more interesting and gives my life purpose. So I would invite everybody to give your life some purpose and, and do this. If you can do it full time, that's very cool. If you cannot do it full time, then do it a couple of hours every day and you know be part of the rebels and be part of the cool guys. And you will meet some of the coolest people that you've ever met in the world. I get to meet people like Jeremy because I do this sort of stuff, not because I secure a bank, because that's very boring, even though it pays very well. So. Um, it's online in English in a range of formats. You can have it to read on, a, on an electronic device. You can read it as web pages, which is really convenient if you're setting up stuff on a laptop. There is um, a response email address inside the book, including an encryption key. I'm very happy to report that over the year plus it's been out now, more than half the feedback we get and questions arrive as encrypted emails which means that people at least got to chapter five. So that's very encouraging. No, no, and on their own. So we get literally emails from all over the world. I've gotten emails from over 50 countries for people who have no local support network. And they manage to do it on their own, completely on their own. And they're usually people who don't have English as their first language either. But somehow they manage to get through it. So you're going to have a Spanish version, which is going to make a life for a lot of people much harder. Spread that around. That Spanish version needs to be in every school in Spain within two years. It needs to be normal to teach 14-year-olds how to have privacy. And it needs to be normal for them to understand what privacy is and what it's for. And it's not just about hiding your dick pics. It's being able to fight your government once every century when that's necessary. Because once every century, it's necessary, and it's now. So um, that's my contact info. That's my PGP fingerprint. All of these pictures will be online somewhere. Um, yes, Xnet will make sure. So all these pictures in an editable format. If you want to reuse any part of this for any educational purpose, you don't have to ask my permission. I'm happy to be credited because it you know, gives me, gets me higher on the NSA shit list and then somebody else will be lower. Uh, that's good. I mean, it's, it's a point of pride now, right? Um, um, but so please reuse any of this. And if there's anything me or other people can help you with technical questions, then please send, uh, send us emails. Uh, because then we can make the next version of the book, which is going to come out in a few months. We can make it better. And if you want to help with the Spanish translations or with Spanish translations in all kinds of different flavors of Spanish, then please report to Xnet because they can use all the help they can get. I'm going to be here until Sunday late afternoon when I have to fly back. And in between then and now, I'm available to help anybody and anybody who wants hands-on help with this. Uh, bring your laptops and USB drives. Thanks for your attention. Él va a dar un taller para periodistas ahora cuando acabamos la última sesión. Eh, vamos un pelín fuera de tiempo. Sé que es un maratón muy duro, pero es que los recursos son lo que hay. Hemos tenido que concentrarlo todo en un día. Aguantad. Hay un compañero todavía que va a contarnos brevemente en directo de México eh, cómo el gobierno utiliza bots para reventar manifestaciones y organizaciones civiles. Será breve, será muy interesante. Ahora, si Jeremy y Arn, eh, si, si te quiere, if you can, eh, si te tenéis pregunta os ruego ser muy breves y please be very short in the in the answer eh, si hay alguna pregunta eh, rápidamente hello just a very short just a very short question you you showed on one of the slides uh, is there a version for children not yet not yet, but I'm happy to talk to, to talk to you about that. I think there should be a version for 12-year-olds, because that's, that's when we need to start training people, or maybe even for 10-year-olds. Yeah, why not? Um, 
Okay. Uh, to Jeremy, uh, you say that uh, that we have to have fun to do that. I think that it's a part, only a part of the of the job, because sometimes we have to be very serious. We cannot uh, make irony or uh, joke about disasters. And uh, every time we, we look at this, that sometimes in the media, they banalize the histories, the tragedies, and putting it as a joke. I think another, another thing that uh, uh, it's very important, you mentioned that, and the enthusiasm and the patience we do, we use for, for bringing it uh, in moving on. That's very important, but uh, uh, also the honesty and the emotion helps for that. Uh, the, I think we have to avoid the perversion of the language of the words, because otherwise we don't know anymore what is the meaning of that word. Uh, I fu wait, fully wait agree. Can we grab yes, 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 uh, fully uh, agree. Uh, This was a long way. Uh, thank Jeremy and Arjun for your amazing talks, uh, very inspiring and so on. Um, with, on the bigger picture about uh, mass surveillance, uh, we are a lot of speaking, the peop we speak a lot about USA surveillance, but what about other state surveillance? What, what does Russia do? What does China do? We have no idea because there haven't been any whistleblower. If they have been, they might have been erased. Um, however, as uh, China is doing, ma is building most of our hardware of computers we are using, what are the, do you have any idea of the risk there are of, um, if we should include that in our threat models and so on? Thanks. Mm. One more, I must. Double <laughs> Hello, can, can you comment on the Europe versus Facebook uh, case related to all this? Thanks. I, I wanted to ask something a bit um, more general. Uh, in some of the discussions it's been touched but I don't think it has been discussed very well. Um, what do you think about the uh, effects of uneven de geographical development in the sense of the fight for privacy and security? Uh, what, what does this mean? All the fights that we are talking about here is based in European Commission or in US whereas these decisions affect other parts of the world which are following behind in tech are very much direct through the use of the state US US state department actually so I, I mean, I'm from Turkey, that's why I'm asking this. It's very personal. So when we discuss about these fights within institutions and how these things work in Europe, in United States, uh, how, how, wh what kind of mindset that do you have also for us maybe? H how can we collaborate in con considering these issues? Because the impact of it for us is different and from the other side the type of activism that we have to do is also different with respect. It's, it's very very quick. If uh, internet uh, was born free, where are we talking about security and not freedom as what we need to achieve from internet? stuff so I am a uh, mostly uh, 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 clueless white guy from Western Europe one of those hyper-privileged people um, and 
I would love to be in a position to help our many friends and brothers and sisters in Africa and Greater Asia, for instance, but I think in order to do that effectively, I first need to live in a functional democracy, and currently that's not the case, regrettably. So I think Europe would be, maybe in a couple of years from now, if we have restored some sort of control over our information processing, um, and have built some of the technologies that, that we've been talking about, I think we will be in a great position to help bring democracy to other parts of the world because then we'll actually have it. But right now, we are a digital colony from the United States of America. Um, and basically from Wall Street and their enforcement arm called the Pentagon. So in that position, we're not really in a position to help anybody else because we can't even help ourselves. That's, that's currently the reality. Um, but I, I, I travel to, for instance, Asia on a regular basis to, to do workshops and training there. Um, but it, yeah, it is even more difficult because there's more language barrier, there's even less money, there's even more repressive, openly violent governments, uh, so it all makes it even more difficult. Uh, but the one thing that is much easier in Asia that I don't have to explain to people that their government is really scary. And that's about half the workshop in Europe usually, so in that sense it's more effective. Uh, to, to your question over here, yes, and 10 times yes, you are right. It's not about making fun of uh, serious things. And thank you for reminding this because all I could have formulated is valid and only valid if we stay true to our school, yo, if we tr stay true to our values, if we stay true to the, the, the humanistic values that we stand for, and of course it implies not to make fun of people's misery, except when they are our political opponents, <laughs> maybe. Uh, oh, then, then to the question, if internet is born free, uh, why do we speak about security and not about freedom? It's a philosophical question, really. First of all, internet is born free, maybe, but then we speak of a very complicated birth because we speak of the alliance of interest from the army, from the university, from industry, and this weird moment in time when they were rightly aligned, that they, 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 they could together produce what we call the internet. Uh, if internet is born free, well, like any kind of freedom, it only exists as long as we protect it. So what we call computer security, cyber security, because cyber everything, uh, is actually just defending our freedoms, like we would do w with any other freedom, by practicing it, by fostering it, by sharing knowledge and good practices on how we do it. Um, on the question over here, thank you, Chris. That's a very difficult question, uh, about China and Russia and whatnot. What we know for a fact is that we're spied uh, on this highest, most impressive level that sounded like the craziest paranoid science fiction before Snowden, not only by the NSA, but also by GCHQ in the UK and their equivalent in Canada, New Zealand and Australia, the so-called five eyes, and that they share this data together. So services and their private and public uh, um, partners have access to all this data. That's the five eyes. Then you have the nine eyes, which is another secret uh, agreement in between uh, services. They probably have access to less, but still. Then you have the bilateral. France has considered some, sometimes under Sarkozy to become the six eyes of the five eyes and try to get access to the full stash of information. But instead of that, they managed a bilateral agreement. So you have a myriad of those bilateral agreements. What we see is a kind of gigantic bazaar, a gigantic card game, a poker game, where every country has so many cards that every country may have every data in several copies already. And there is no way we can know what's happening without having dozens new whistleblowers that we badly need today. So we cannot know for sure the answer to your question. But, but even China, if they have as sophisticated tools as we believe they have, uh, which means probably almost as sophisticated or as sophisticated as the, the NSATAO and, and those other uh, programs, um, they need secure software. If Russia is spying on everyone, then it's secure software as well. And this is the beauty of free software, is that it is a common middle ground for people of very diverging interests. 
if Chinese security services were to work on the same free software as people from the NSA, as people from IBM, as people from some university in Guatemala, they would work on the same tool and they would all together benefit from everybody else. They could all audit everybody else's code. They would all try to put backdoors in the code, obviously. But it is a common benefit we get from the sum of those diverging interests. And this is why Libre Software is the only way to go if we want to, to achieve secure uh, software sometimes. So, so um, a point that is often overlooked a very glaring point from the whole Snowden case is that the National Security Agency, the most well-funded intelligence agency on the planet, is not able to protect its own data once they have collected it. And so one of the strongest arguments, operational arguments against mass surveillance, alongside from the morality and, and the fact that it doesn't, doesn't prevent an operational argument, is that once you have collected all this stuff, you can't defend it. Because a 29-year-old just walked out the door with 1.7 million above top secret classified documents, and you didn't even notice until the Guardian pasted it all over the front page. And that's the NSA. They have $100 billion a year, and they completely fucked it up. So you can be sure that it's not just the Chinese intelligence agency that has infiltrated them, but also most of their suppliers, which includes Boeing, Northrop Grumman, IBM, my former employer, all those kinds of companies, but also the Medellin cartel and the Pakistani intelligence, the Mossad and the Indians and the Brazilians and everybody. Because why would you build your own global infrastructure if you can just you know, send some of your people to go contract at the NSA via a commercial consulting company and get the goodies that way, it's much cheaper. So assume that everybody has this stuff. And then, yes, we were stupid enough to put our entire industrial infrastructure in China. So of course the Chinese government is now gonna backdoor every phone they make, duh. Yes, that's obvious. We're going to get a whistleblower at some point. Oh, so, so to add a little something on this point, uh, we need free hardware. But yes. it, it means we need to, to design that hardware, we need to manufacture it, and we need a tool chain to be able to verify that the hardware we got delivered in our home is the one we designed and ordered. It means tearing it apart, putting some clamps on the chips, making the checksums of these chips and having tools that are so far very, very hard to get. And this is part of what we should achieve uh, with, with free hardware. This is, this is precisely the sort of stuff that Europe should be doing. And this is, A, it is a precondition for having the human right to privacy, which you know we fought a whole bunch of wars over to have it. And if we let it go, then say goodbye to, to democracy, basically. The privacy is the one human right you need to fight for all the other ones. And if we don't have privacy anymore, you can say goodbye to any form of social progress for the future. It's, it's, it'll be over, it'll be done. And, and any form of activism will be preempted by mass surveillance and you won't get anywhere. So activists that organize themselves on Facebook, they tend to get completely preempted before they ever got off the ground. Why? Because they're being monitored in real time to the last bit. And so it never really goes anywhere generally. Um, so we need to do this, and, but it's, it's a massive economic opportunity for Europe as well. It's 250 billion euros a year. Who doesn't like that? Millions of jobs. It's there for the taking. It's just a political choice to stop buying foreign crap. It's a really simple thing. Yeah. I like it. So I want to make, sorry, I'm Rayo from Bits of Freedom from the Netherlands. I would like to make one comment. Um, uh, Arjan was, say, was talking about um, doing the same work in other regions of the world. And I think that is um, very important uh, to do right now. Because um, if they are less uh, digitally developed uh, as than we are, then I think that is exactly an opportunity to win. Because it is way more easy to change something which is coming than to change something which is already existing, as we um, uh, see happening here. So I think that um, if, let's go back to uh, Jeremy's question in the beginning, what should be our next uh, thing to work on? Then I think it is stop looking at ourselves and start looking at all of those regions where there's no attention at all. Thank you. Can I add a little something on this very quick? Yes, we, we must do this 100%, but not in some form of neo-colonial approach. Like, you know, bringing the bags of rice instead of helping people to develop their own culture. And in that case, I was uh, some months ago in Colombia, just to realize on the first night that for the first time I was in a country at war. 
where people disappeared because of their political opinion. So I couldn't just sit and say, hey, contact your elected representative, say your minister is a bitch, do this, do that, because people may really get killed. So in terms of security, it goes back to the very core, the very fundamental of building a threat model, making risk analysis, which is a long, uh, a hard process, and, and and you cannot get security without that. So it is about doing it exactly the way you do it, but by bringing good practices, fundamental processes, rather than trying to bring uh, turnkey solutions. And it takes more time and more effort, but I'm sure that's the right way of doing it, yes? One, one, one other point on Latin America, sorry. One point on Latin America. So Latin America is actually ahead of the Western world when it comes to free software and open standard policies. Peru was the first country that had an integrated policy back in 2003, and many of the stuff that I used in the Netherlands actually came from them. So, you know, I, I, I think we are the ignorant assholes here in this game. Um, and, and, and just because a country has a per capita lower income, that doesn't mean that they're less technologically advanced. We shouldn't measure our technological advances on how much foreign crap we buy, which is what we tend to do. And it's, it's horseshit. Okay, so thanks a lot. A uh, uh, moment. No, no, no. No, no. <laughs> no, we have to stop because there is a the person in Mexico waiting three hours in front of a screen. He's probably... Uh, okay. Puedes proyectarlo? Thanks a lot.